Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. For this session, we will be dealing with the subject of disruptive innovation in Asia. The session will be carried out in English, so please use the interpretation receivers if necessary. It's an innovation session, and um, I think some of people here might be a little bit tired because they didn't have a break, but uh, we're going to try to run this on time and see if we, everyone can get out for lunch at 12 o'clock. That's our goal. And Joe, I know you have a flight to catch, right? So we'll have a dead stop at 12 o'clock. And if you run over, please um, at least keep, keep me in check in terms of time, OK? So uh, in our session, I think we actually have a very brief presentation from all three of the panelists here. And uh, they're going to actually tell us a little bit about where they came from and their own experience with disruptive technologies, either they're either whether they are disrupting or being disrupted, I'm not sure, but uh, they're going to give us some examples. And unlike other sessions, we also want to make this uh, very interactive. So you will see panelists interrupting each other, but you know, and they might be rude, but please don't mind me. That's how I instruct them to behave. So let's let's see if we can get going. So let's uh, start with Joe. Your presentation. Should I stand up? Or Ah, uh, you can stand up or lie on the floor, whatever makes you most comfortable. Uh, let's be, uh, lie down. Let's lie down. Be, uh, disruptive. <laughs> well, uh, today uh, I'm going to share with you um, something about Ren Ren and, and most importantly about some examples of disruptive innovations okay, in China. Let's see the disruptive photo. <laughs> and, and the first disruptive photo I'm going to show is this one. This photo was taken 12 years ago. And you guys are disrupting the restaurant industry? No, we were, we were disrupting the mobile internet industry 12 years ago. So we, that's how Rayran got started. We were started in a two bedroom apartment. This picture was taken uh, 12 years ago in the living room of that apartment. And is that and you in the middle? That was the fat guy. The fat guy in the middle, that was me. We yeah. haven't changed. The guy who <laughs> was sitting on the left, who was standing on the left, uh, who was uh, adding some rice to his already uh, empty bowl. <laughs> that, that, that was the guy who came up with the idea of, of doing a social networking site. And by uh, the way, two years after that. What were you guys eating on that day? Do you remember? Th th that was uh, some home cooked meal by an old lady that we, we were bought in, uh, in the lunchtime. She would cook that food. So starting from 11 o'clock, the, the, the guys are becoming restless because the smell come out of the kitchen. <laughs> and starting to disrupting the whole working environment. But that's how we get started. So you guys had humble origins. <laughs> yes, and uh, fast forward 12 years now, um, we have um, 2,000 employees, and uh, we, we have three lines of business, the most important one being Ren Ren, the social networking site. And then the middle, uh, in the middle is, is the gaming, uh, mostly mobile gaming business, and we also acquired a video company from you. Yes, actually, that was my investment way back during the Adobe days, 56.com. So thank you very much, Joe. We paid a premium <laughs> for that. But it's doing great. After we acquired the company, now it's, uh, it's been growing every year as one of the leading players in UGC video in China. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sh uh, share with you some of the key metrics of the company. And, uh, and I'm probably the only guy who's going to show you a declining uh, number here. Uh, I'm going to tell you why in the next screen. Uh, the, the one on the left is of registered users. We have two, more than 200 million users. And our monthly users have been growing up uh, because of disruption. And also came down last year because of another disruption. Uh, let me talk about that. There's two. So you, you're saying you've been disrupting, but also being disrupted at the same time? Yes, okay. yes. That's my job. My job is disrupting people, but one thing where I get disrupted by other people. And now it's my turn to get back. Um, the first disruption uh, in my life was the rise of social networks, which is in the, in the form of Friendster. I think it came out in 2003 or 4. And ever since then, because at that time, we already had quite a few years of experience doing community, online community. So that, that product immediately caught my attention. I, I realized the product DNA is so much better than BBS. So we started exploring different versions of, of uh, social networking, started with the virtual name and the yeah. real name, students, so on and so forth. And finally, the one that worked out is Ren Ren, which is a real name based social network starting from So you college. tried everything? We tried three different, three different versions, and uh, it worked. And that's the first disruption that took us here. And then the second disruption that uh, disrupted us 
is the rise of mobile messaging, which this gentleman knows really well. <laughs> uh, it started in 2010 and 11, three, four years ago. Uh, in China at that time, it was a kick and talk box from Hong Kong. Ah, okay. And uh, <clears throat> being a social networking guy who was already successful in the content, that wave didn't caught our attention immediately. But finally, we caught it in uh, 2012. And we started to pivoting our services onto mobile. Most importantly, also pivoting toward messaging. So after that, um, let me talk about three examples of disruptive innovations in China, because that's the main purpose of this. And the first example I'm going to talk about is actually um, WeChat. WeChat, as you know, is a competitor, but I don't mind talking about them because they are really disruptive in what they do. I just and, want to do a quick check. Do people yes. know WeChat in this audience? Can you, if you, if you heard of it, please raise hand. Yeah. So maybe uh, it's a very small minority. So Joe, maybe you should tell them what it is. <laughs> it, it is one of the most uh, successful internet products in China. It's basically mobile messaging. And uh, I think it had uh, like worldwide of uh, 400, 500. Uh, users. Users. It's like a line of China. Uh, it, it had no, the most important, it had no business model until two months ago until two months ago. And that, that business model is what I'm gonna talk about, about them. Uh, during the Chinese New Year, um, well, okay, during the, during the Chinese New Year, I wanna make sure the page is showing is the, okay. So there was this, um, they launched a product called a, a, a WeChat wallet. And uh, particularly they ran a social game on top of it called, a, called a WeChat uh, money bags. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with Chinese culture, let me just fast forward to this page. During the Chinese New Year, the senior people in the family or in the organization would typically give out these red envelopes with, no some, with money, right? As a token of appreciation and friendship and love, right? So I'm still waiting to receive mine from you. Uh, yeah, if you join he hasn't the same given me a the yet. group, <laughs> yes. So what you do, let's say this guy have $100 wants to give away as a red envelope, right? So he give it away and every one of his friends can basically grab it. But you don't exactly know how many, how much money you're gonna grab from the $100 uh, pot, right? So it's really chance-based, lucky draw. This is like social gaming and it combines really well with, with the, the occasion of uh, Chinese New Year. So everybody has a different, some people get five yuan, some people get 10 yuan, some people get 21 yuan, right? So, but the, the, the thing is that after you play this game, in order to claim that money, which is virtual, if you linked up your payment, you know, bank card or credit card, you can claim that money in real, right? So that's how WeChat was able to build their payment this is one example they built. Yeah, and I saw some numbers, not something like in two months, now WeChat has something like 200 million bank accounts associated with their service, which exactly. is like crazy. That's, yeah, that's like one Twice way. the population of Japan. Yes, so, so I think the implication for that is that this is a very good example of vertical integration, uh, uh, a business model into you know, a disruptive innovation from China. And, and I think, you uh, see, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Do, do you see WeChat now as a, see a messaging platform or do you see them as a payment platform? Uh, it's a messaging platform to keep the users engaged. And it's a payment platform for them to monetize and also providing convenience for the users. So, so uh, if you look at the value proposition of the messaging part, actually they save user money. So eventually this become a, a uh, 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 application that save people money or save people time. So I think the value, the total value proposition. And I think Alibaba there. is actually one party being disrupted by this because they used to completely own the payment market, but now they have a serious contender. Yeah, it, it's really interesting because you know, aside from Japan where it's been happening for a few years, this is probably the prime example of payments being, being made through mobile devices. And I think every country in the world is trying to figure out the financing models of not having a wallet, not having a credit card, and everything being stored in your phone. And, and this is probably the prime example that we're seeing at global level. Yeah, and uh, I don't, do you have the taxi example in here or no? I don't have the taxi okay, example, but I wanna, I wanna ask uh, yeah. a good question. Are you gonna do it with a car car? Um, 
Uh, when? <laughs> we, we have just announced that we'll be allowing our users to send money, send and receive money through our application. Did you so come up with the idea yourself or you just saw what's happening in China? No, just, no, just, this just was for, off the record. And then um, I, I, I can only say nice things about Tencent because they're, <laughs> right. they're our yeah. second largest shareholder. Ah, so, so there's knowledge sharing. We, we, we love Tencent. <laughs> But if you copy from the investor, you don't have to pay a license fee, so to copy them. That's a good, good idea. They yeah. do a good job in that. <laughs> <laughs> and my uh, second example is about truly innovative company. Unlike Tencent, this company has been around for three to four years. Its name is called Xiaomi, means uh, little small rice. Uh, they are the biggest player in the, uh, phone, uh, the mobile phone business. I want to talk about it because it's sort of personal. It started by uh, a friend of mine, long-term friend of mine, actually my classmate back in college for half a year. Really? Yes. Uh, we both went to Wuhan University. I was studying physics. He was, uh, Lei Jing was studying computer science. On a second, on, on, as when I was a sophomore, I transferred to computer science for half a year. And that's when we met. And since then, we've been staying in contact. And Lei Jing's uh, you know, uh, career path is very unique. He spent the, f the first 20 years of his career fighting with one company, Microsoft. <laughs> he was where most of the Microsoft software are pirated in China. He tried to, he tried to produce a homegrown software that charged money. This is his Kingsoft years. Kingsoft. Right? It's very difficult, but they, they survived and they made some money and the company went IPO. But that's not clearly not his most successful uh, adventure. But then three years ago when Android, which with the help of Google, was launched, uh, obviously a lot of people sensed big opportunity. He started this company with um, you know, seven other guys. I think what's unique about this company, I want to talk about a little bit, is that each of the founding guys, founding members, were making more than a million dollars a year before starting this company, right? So this is clearly a, a bunch of guys with a conviction, right? <laughs> and number two, the, when they're getting started with no product, just eight guys, the company valuation is already $200 million, right? With no product, just a uh, bunch of guys. Just like one this. guy. <laughs> so we're going to do this. Give us, you know, $50 million for $200 Two hundred million pre. Uh, that's probably one of the reasons I never thought about investing in them because anything that my, my class may sell is always expensive. But uh, <laughs> it turns out it's going to be more expensive a few years after that. So um, I want to talk about the product. Uh, this is the product they made. Um, it's Xiaomi three. Oh, and by the way, can, can I just talk about the valuation a little bit? I've seen the yeah. latest round of Xiaomi's private round. Now Xiaomi is worth more than uh, Nokia and the Motorola combined their recent sales value. So this little company started by eight guys like three years ago is now worth more than two of those very traditional large mobile manufacturers. This is amazing. The, the rumored valuation now is 20 to $30 billion. Um, okay, so what's disruptive about this company uh, in addition to being able to build a really good product? I think the most important is that they, they innovated on business model, right? So number one, you could, the only way you can buy this phone is to, pay, is to buy it on the internet. They don't have retail channels. They bypass the whole mobile phone radio, uh, you know, retail channels and sell directly to consumers. And number two, they never advertise. The only marketing they had is social media, word of mouth. So they fully leverage on platforms like Renren and Sina Weibo, right? So everything is word of mouth. But the reason, but you talk to him, you say, why you have so much word of mouth? He will tell you, it's because we have superior value proposition. Because I actually experienced, I recently switched to a, a Xiaomi 3 phone, which is a high-end phone selling for $300. But if you buy, like average Chinese consumer, you would buy the low-end phone for $100. Once you get that phone, you, re, you, know, you like it so much, because it's almost as good as another phone that's charge you two or three hundred uh, dollars. I think spec-wise, they're like a top-end Samsung phone, except the price is less than half. Yes. Very hard, actually high-end hardware so, spec. So their competition is intensifying, right? But this is how to deal with competition, right? They, in addition to going direct, I, I call them this the sort of the Dell for smartphones, but in addition to being Dell smartphones, they go way beyond that. They're now offering cloud services. And also, because they control the user interface, right? They, it's Android phone, that they build a layer of a user interface on top of Android. 
So allowing you to control almost every aspect of the user experience, right? I think the end-to-end -end model controlling everything except for manufacturing, which, which they outsource, is a very smart way of innovation. So in my mind, that's business model innovation. And finally, I'm going to show you something that's sort of very small innovation. is about feature integration. So when uh, Ren Ren moved from PC to mobile, we're asking ourselves, what can we do differently on mobile? Right? The two answers come up. One is the voice. You don't have voice on PC. The other, most importantly, is location. So I'm not going to talk about location right now because we're still working on it. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about voice. So when you open that Ren Ren publisher, like Facebook publisher, right? Three, you know, you could publish your status, you publish your photo, a video. But on the lower left, the button says you could publish a, a, a photo with voice. So you click that. And it allows you to upload a photo, and you also record a voice caption. And this is one example of a friend of mine on Ren Ren. He published a photo, and he attached, uh, he attached uh, 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 audio with that. So I couldn't really make out what is he really talking about. So I click on it, and you're going to hear the voice. It's in Chinese, so read the caption here in Chinese. Shiwalaw The sound that he attached to this photo is actually coming from the heartbeat of his unborn baby in his wife's belly when they went to the doctor checkup. So three years ago when we went IPO, one of the investors asked me, what is the, vi what is the vision and the mission for Rin Rin, right? After looking out, looking out at the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco, I was in the top building, I realized our mission is really to record human history particularly Chinese human history. And I would say this, that with advanced features, technology, this is a wonderful piece of human history we're recording, even before the guy was born. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. So, Ro, are you ready? Yep. So obviously, Joe went a little bit over his time, so let's see if you can run the rest of the ship a little bit tighter. <laughs> I'll, I'll cut it short. No problem. Okay, can we have the second presentation, please? Ah, oh, lovely. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, early days. Um, I'm not the founder of the company to, to start off with. Um, uh, a gentleman by the name of Brian Kim founded the company. And uh, he used to be the CEO of NHN, the largest internet company in Korea. But he wanted to uh, go back to okay. the startup days and start his own company. And this was in uh, 2006, December. Uh, and he founded a company called IB Lab, which mm -hmm. later became Kakao Corporation. But at the time... Uh, um, what, what are those people doing? Coding? Uh, they're sleeping. And hopefully, you know, they, after a long day's work, but they, they might have been drunk. Have, have a long party uh, the night before. But at, at the time, there were about 10 employees, uh, a lot of uh, work during the nights. And so I, I was told this was uh, after a long working night. Yeah, that's what they say. <laughs> <laughs> but definitely, uh, I'm not in the picture. Um, and so that was our, our early days. We, we did web services at the time. We, we launched a service called uh, uh, Wizia.com and also Brew.com. Uh, the audience is quiet because it, it, nobody used it. it. It was a big, miserable failure. So after uh, three years, uh, we, we gave it one last shot, and that was uh, Cacao. Cacao. Oh, so before Cacao came out, there was a series of failures. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, three years of very harsh times. Um, and right before we, we switched to mobile, um, we were thinking of, uh, there, there was a big dis dispute within the company of uh, whether we should shut down and just move on with our lives or whether to give it one last chance. 
And luckily for us, um, we, we switched to mobile and launched the service called Kakao Talk. Um, everybody in Japan is using Line, I guess, but in Korea, Kakao Talk is uh, very popular. Uh, it's interesting. If you go back the family tree, both came from N people from NHN. <laughs> yes, the founders came from NHN, um, including myself uh, and, and Brian. And, and the guy who actually developed the application was an engineer who used to work for NHN. Just to put it time perspective, when was Kakaoto created initially? When was that? We launched the service in March of 2010. And Lion came out, what was it, uh, 20, 2011, June? Or, well, I thought or a year July, later. Uh, yeah. One year later. WeChat, do you know when it came out? WeChat was, was uh, around the time when, when uh, Lion was launched, I think. Yeah. You guys are definitely early. Right, right. And so um, we, we set up uh, Japan subsidiary back in uh, uh, July of uh, 2011. Um, so by the way, you know, obviously now we know it's, it's messaging became a big success, but I want to know when you guys are just run out of money and just about to die, what were you guys thinking when you created this service? What was, what was going through the mind of the founders there? Um, we, we've had that experience with uh, NHN, with, with Han Game, with Neva, that if you, if you make a good service that, that the people love, then you really don't have to worry about the business model or, or revenue because somehow, you know, if you have the traffic, you, you can put, implement all kinds of uh, uh, innovative business models to make money. Uh, is, is that true in China as well, Joe? Business model, we, we can we don't worry about, just build audience first? <laughs> Generally, that's the B2C consumer internet companies philosophy, right? I mean, I, I don't know any other company that did it out of any, any other way around. So we, we did have that, have that experience. When Neva first, first came uh, out, uh, the search revenue model wasn't there. And so that, that came later on. With games also, with Han Game, when, uh, when Brian first founded the, the company and the service, there was no business model. Um, but eventually, in Year two, year two years down the road, we came up with uh, game items that people could s subscribe to. And so the, basically the, the idea was the same. Um, if we can come up with a popular service, uh, the revenue will come in. And luckily for us, it, it took uh, two and a half years to get there, but we finally got there. Um, what we started off as a uh, mobile messaging service has now really grown into a mobile social platform. And uh, since we started with Kakao Talk, there's a relationship that has formed with Kakao Talk users. Um, an average Kakao Talk user has about 180 friends, and th it is this network of friends, j just like Facebook friends, uh, that share content, share uh, um, items together. And so we've kind of fanned out to different um, platforms. Uh, on, the, on the left hand side, you see marketing platforms where um, you can advertise your products or services. On the right hand side, uh, you have content platform uh, where you can share games, uh, send emoticons to your friends. And then on, on the bottom, uh, social commerce has, has become a, a, a rapidly growing area for us. We started off selling $3 uh, Starbucks coffee, but now on Valentine's Day, we're selling a $1,000 diamond necklace and ring set. And so um, we're seeing a very fast move from web to mobile. So, so um, you know, our image of like lying was that you, obviously you're very strong in messaging, but you also I think about, I mean, Kakao is, I think about the game platform you guys built, which has been very successful. But apart from the me core messaging and games, then what are the, uh, the most trafficked uh, part of this business today? Well, obviously, uh, messaging is, is the largest, uh, most heavily used. I mean, used. As, apart from messaging apart and from games. Apart from messaging. Um, we also have um, uh, music. Uh, we also have a Instagram-like service called Kakao Story. Um, Does I'll that have voice? <laughs> yes, we do have voice. I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> but um, now, Kakao Talk has about 130 million users which seems small now with, uh, with uh, WhatsApp and uh, Line uh, getting more than uh, 4 billion us uh, 400 million users. Um, but we service about 5.5 billion messages a day. 
We also have a sister application that uses the social graph from Kakao Talk uh, called Kakao Story. Um, in, in the first nine days of launch, we, we, got, we, we got 10 million users, and now uh, it, it's up to 55 million. And so apart from Kakao Talk, Kakao Story has the largest user base. And when you have 130 million users, how, how much of that, how many of that is actually coming from Korea? Um, I would say half. half. But then, and what's the population of Korea? <laughs> then the population of Korea is, is a little over 50 million. Um, so w when we say 130 million users, is, is, it's not really actual people. It's uh, SMS certified phone numbers. phone numbers. So we have 130 million phone numbers that, that we have. And so Koreans, they, they switch phone numbers. Some people have two phone numbers. And so um, it, there, there is a bit of double counting. But in there. you must have like incredibly high local market share. Then. It's like 80, 90 percent of the smartphones in Korea is installed of, with Kakao. Of the 50 million um, population of Korea, 73 uh, percent are smartphone users. And of the 73 percent, 93 percent are Kakao Talk users. So we've kind of cornered the market in Korea. Um, and then games. Um, everybody talked about games, but that is our major revenue driver. And uh, in the year and a half that we've serviced games, uh, there are nine games that have exceeded the 10 million download marker, um, and uh, two have exceeded more than 20 million. Um, we've uh, amassed uh, about a billion dollars in revenue total, so um, I'll, I'll get to games in a minute. But then there's also other services like uh, Kakao Group and Kakao Music that have exceeded 10 million users. I remember looking at uh, iOS revenue ranking in Korea a while back, and I like uh, all of the top 10, like most of them are Kakao games. Right, um, those were the highly uh, revenue generating games. Um, we, we had at one point all of the top 20 um, top grossing applications. And if you're that strong, does Apple them something, does something nasty to you or are they nice to you? They're, they're very <laughs> nice to us. They're very nice to us and, and uh, we thank them. <laughs> um, disruptive challenges. Uh, this was back in uh, June of 2012. Uh, we launched a MVOIP service called Voice Talk. And, and really this was after um, um, Line launched uh, their, their MVIP service, and even one of the local telcos had uh, uh, this MVIP service. But since we had a very strong user base in Korea, um, there was a lot of commotion that was caused because of this, and uh, there was talk about um, regulating uh, these OTT services just as heavily as the, the carriers. And so, so who are those people? Um, the gentleman on the middle it was a representative from YMCA. He was, uh, you know, a pro-consumer uh, activist. And then the f on the far right, uh, that, that was a National Assembly member, a congressman, who sponsored the event. Uh, oh, and so um, <clears throat> to this day, net neutrality is still a, a, a big issue. And um, but I think uh, this was. Uh, Positive in a sense that we, the, the carriers and, and companies like us really try, started trying to, to communicate and to, to um, understand each other's position. And uh, since then, we've come a long way. And, uh, okay, you wanted us to come up with three disruptive services in yes. our regions. Yes, and, I uh, want to hear about that. I, I could only come up with one, <laughs> and one from, from our company. <laughs> um, you're, you're saying there's only one company in Korea that's doing disrupting things, that's you? <laughs> uh, I'm just saying I'm ignorant. Sounds a bit self-serving, but let's, let's, for, the, for the moment, I'm going, to I'm going to believe you and let's hear what you're disrupting here. I'm, I'm, I'm doing some shameless marketing for, for <laughs> our company. <laughs> yeah, Joseph was very honest. <laughs> okay, so what um, is this? Be because of the high penetration rate, the, the smartphone penetration rate in Korea, the shift from, from web, the, from PC to, to mobile is happening much faster than, than any other region. And I think this game is, is a prime example. Um, when, when people talk about Kakao talk and, and messaging, 
Uh, they, they think that, you know, they look at games as a revenue driver, but it, it's, it's only really the start. I think the, the importance of the social graph uh, will become more evident since the, the smartphone device is an individual device. And once you have that social graph, um, you, you can do games, you can do commerce, there's, there's all sorts of things uh, you will see exp uh, expanding into different areas. And so uh, I think game was, was a start for us. Uh, nobody really thought about matching messenger uh, service with games, but uh, with that, um, I, th I think there was a huge shift uh, from internet games to, to mobile games. And now, um, although uh, web-based games are still very popular and, and much larger uh, in size. The speed at which uh, mobile games are growing has, has really disrupted the game industry. And right now it's the game industry, but who knows down the road in a couple of years, some uh, other industries. Uh, so go, I have a question. So when Facebook did this on their platform, uh, it, you know, out of that emerged companies like, um, of course, Zynga, Playfish, and play them, those large social network companies. Is any new big game companies emerging out of um, your platform, or is it just Kakao takes all, that kind of business? Uh, <laughs> good question. Um, we only service third-party developed games, and uh, companies like Sunday Todd's, which launched one of the first games on our platform, which was Anypang, uh, they recently IPO'd, they, oh, they're, okay. they're becoming a, a huge success story in, in Korea among the startups. And traditionally, um, companies which have focused on web have now moved their focus to, to mobile. And companies like WeMade or CJ uh, E&M, um, who traditionally focused on web games, have now shifted to mobile and, and, and having um, grown their revenue, they're, they're becoming a huge player, not just in Korea, but uh, all over the world. So some of lot of the, all of these games have a Kakao logo, but it's actually provided by third-party game developers for the most part. Correct. Yeah. And and they used our social graph to to show the interaction between uh, different users. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Kareem, are you going to present or should we just take a break? What do you think? <laughs> Whatever you'd like. Oh, <laughs> who is this uh, guy? <laughs> who is this guy? Yeah, that's a very good guy? question. That's a very good question. Um, first, I, I, I'd like to uh, thank Mikitani San for organizing this. I think it's fantastic to see um, people supporting the ecosystem in this country and, uh, and spending so much time to continue to develop it. And also to obviously all the panelists that are here, I think has been a very interesting couple of days. And it's very important. Uh, both from an Asia-Pacific perspective, but, but uh, clearly from a Japan perspective, that we continue to drive evolution and, and continue to disrupt the current ecosystem. So it's great to be here. And, and this photo that you see behind me uh, is the actually only proof that I have that I had hair at some stage. <laughs> Um, Are I, you being uh, disrupted? <laughs> I have been seriously disrupted. <laughs> and unfortunately, there's been nothing to save me. Um, I, I thought I'd show this, uh, this picture because it was taken essentially when I started working. Um, and I started working in Hong Kong. And uh, at the time... Um, uh, when? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I want to put some time, year, time just, stamp just on Just over 20 years ago. 20 years ago in Just Hong over Kong. 20 years ago. And uh, um, no, at the time, it was a very simple world in the sense that all of the media were, you know, without much data or information. You relied on inferred data to know what audience you would have in the magazines that uh, I published. And, uh, and you, what were you doing there? Were you working in a math fashion magazine or were you modeling? I know, I was not <laughs> modeling. I was not modeling far from it. I, I did publish a number of fashion magazines in Hong Kong. Then I lived in Korea for a period of time where I published uh, a number of fashion car magazines as well. Um, and, and at the time we had very little data about audiences. I thought I knew everything about you know, selling magazines and selling to audiences. It was a very simple world. And the reality of that world is, at the time, my main mode of communication was a fax machine. Sorry, uh, what is fax machine? I think a lot of people machine? have never yeah. seen this before. Can I'm you sure you don't know this. Who, who here has used a fax machine? God, wow. I'm showing my age here. This is quite <laughs> incredible. Okay, 
So a fax machine was a very rudimentary mode of communication where you essentially inserted a piece of paper in this machine and it, it came up at the other end with uh, hopefully uh, the intended communication to the people you wanted to reach. Wow, so you get the exact image on the other end? <laughs> That's right. Wow. Um, and the reality is that everything's changed. And w what's more, more important, though, is when you think about that period of time between you know, me using a fax machine to now, the reality is that you know, I think, uh, and many of us think, that we traditional internet users. And you know, this might have been true a couple of years ago. Uh, we started accessing the internet on desktop devices, uh, we then moved on to smartphones, um, and for Japan, you know, to iMode, and we then moved on to tablets. The reality of the current internet is completely different. The reality of the current internet is that the traditional users, the next generation of users of the internet, will only ever had their first access to the internet on mobile devices, and that changes everything. Mobile is completely changing the internet, and users in this region, in Asia, are going to be the driving force at global level because there are more people in this region that will have more experiences with mobile so, so, devices. So do you think that like, there's people here looking, some, looking, using some devices, I think, that has keyboards? I, think, I don't think they're mobile devices. Do you think those people will be basically outdated and be outrun by those new generation who have not actually Learn, bother to learn to use those keyboards. I, I think we're going to see a continuous shift, uh, meaning that mobile and tablets are going to become more and more important. And you see that in the shipments of PC versus tablets and, and mobile devices. I think it's pretty clear. And on top of that, I think most importantly, you're going to see different types of usage on mobile devices in the future. We, we're only at the very beginning of the mobile internet. I mean, remember that you know, four of the countries with the largest population in the world have you know, way more than half of their population that's not connected yet. It's going to change over the next few years. So mobile is becoming more and more important as part of it. And, and the type of things that you really want to see on the mobile devices are going to be different. You don't necessarily want to search for answers all the time. You want um, any providers that you have to start giving you the answers in advance or have a conversation with them. So. The next image that I have is actually a video that shows how you know, we're starting to think about it at Google, and, and I'm going to just play the video here. Yeah. So, so this video is, uh, essentially talks about one of my favorite products at Google called Google Now, which essentially combines very important data to you, very difficult data to acquire, um, you know, calendar information with traffic information, um, uh, with location information, and provides you then real useful benefits, meaning you, know, you need to leave right now if you want to go and get your kids to school. Um, so this type of and uh, no, internet is only available thanks to mobile devices. It provides great benefit to people, and I think that you seeing mobile devices essentially, you know, whether it's by providing information that you need now, you know, the currency if you know you've just arrived from Japan, the time zone or the jet time time lag to your house if you want to call your kid, or payment information as we have seen with WeChat. The, the mobile internet is only beginning and will change everything. Um, that we're seeing at a global level. So how, Kareem, how do you, oh, sorry, go ahead. How, how do you uh, respond to uh, the issue of, of privacy? Um, there's a lot of concern about, you know, Google Actually, being yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. <laughs> Yesterday, actually, Larry Esson was talking about privacy, okay, basically telling us, okay, consumers just forget, you know, give up your privacy for convenience. I didn't actually agree with all the things he said, but actually for Google now, I realized, you know, Google is seriously violating my privacy by going through my Gmail to get flight information and so on. But actually, the end result is actually very convenient. So I'm kind of caught in between. I don't like Google going all of my stuff, but there is actually some tangible benefit. So I, I think you, you're highlighting a very strong point. Obviously, privacy is critical and critical to users. So uh, there's a bunch of things that we can do around this. The first one is give user controls. So it's very important that users have the ability to decide whether 
they want to provide access to information to uh, a multitude of suppliers. And, and the reality now is when you're getting um, access to the internet on your device and when you're downloading apps, you're saying yes to a bunch of things and you don't really know what yes, you're saying. Because yes they're to. in tiny letters that I don't understand. Something that your lawyers are prepared for us to read, but we never read. Well, any company that provides apps on the internet, and that's that's the reality. Like it's a, and a, it's updating all the time, and every time it's updating, it's asking for new permissions. And, and it's very complex for consumers to understand what permissions it's asking to have access to. Um, so um, it, it's very important to give user control, but at the same time, it's very important to su simplify these controls. Um, the other point, um, which um, is critical that you have mentioned is that you really need to provide a great user benefit. No. Obviously, you don't want to provide all access to all your data to every company that wants to access it. And when you look at some of the publishers online, um, you may access a page from you know, one of the world-renowned newspapers and have a, you know, 40 different types of cookies that are being dropped on you from companies you've never heard of. This is not a great outcome for, uh, for any consumers. However, when you have companies providing you with great information that is useful to you, uh, then you may think that one, you're trusting this company, and two, you know that the information is something valuable that's not gonna be misused and that provides a great benefit that helps your life. And, and that's really where I think as a, an IT industry overall, we need to continue getting better at explaining how our services can really improve the lives of the people that are using them. So as, as, as part of this, um, I was talking about mobile and, and, and uh, I know, talking about mobile in the context of this region. So if you look at it, essentially this is the traffic, and I, I think uh, the CEO of Cisco mentioned it uh, a little bit earlier. This is a, uh, the traffic from Ericsson data, not Cisco data, uh, of the mobile internet in 2013. And you see in 2013 that already Asia Pacific is a leader at global level. Well, what is this other mobile devices category in here? Well, it's all of the um, dumb phones, essentially the feature phones that exist uh, uh, around the world. And, and uh, obviously, Asia Pacific has a lot more feature phone than the rest of the world, as the rest of the world has moved faster in many cases to smartphones. Uh, if, you, if you start looking at it in 2019, so a few years from now, uh, essentially, Asia Pacific is literally off the charts. Wow. So let me fix this. You see that Asia Pacific, by far, is the leading area for mobile consumption of data at global level. And, and that's why I meant you know, a few minutes ago when I talked about the world learning from Asia, there is absolutely no doubt that Asia and the users in this region will teach the rest of the world what needs to happen at user level. There is absolutely no doubt that some of the companies that are being created now in this region, some of them that have been created a few years ago, you know, some of them represented in this panel, will not only be incredibly successful in this region, but also will expand at global level. Um, and it's incredibly exciting for this region, but it's only exciting if people are looking at the opportunity and investing in it. And uh, the next chart I wanted to show essentially reminds me of some of these issues. Now, here you're essentially looking at a picture of the Vatican and, and the Pope Annunciation in 2005 and 2013. You clearly see here, you know, I look at a lot of data. This is a picture that tells me a lot about data. You clearly see here the change that has happened in the world. Now, this is clear disruption. 2005, that not one single person on a phone taking a picture. Actually, there's one. On the right hand corner. There's one on the right hand corner. <laughs> uh, uh, Just one. You can't take a picture. This is <laughs> on a feature phone. <laughs> this is a Motorola Razr. It doesn't take a picture. I can tell you that. Um, but the uh, the 2013 picture, essentially, everybody's on phones or tablets. A, a, a totally different view of the world. And you now, wh what I'm going to tell you now might, might shock you. I was very, very fortunate. Uh, to move to the US in 2010 and to look after our global mobile business at Google. And from there, I had a, a great viewpoint on how the mobile internet was developing. The reality is that we had all the data points already. It was very clear where the mobile internet was going. Uh, it was very clear already at the time that many companies had a lot of their traffic coming from mobile devices. But these companies are so slow to move. No, large companies, small companies are incredibly slow to follow users. Even now, when I look at some of our traffic, some of the traffic that our clients are getting, 
what the users are doing, meaning spending more time online than they do on main media, people are slow to move. We get a global level more than 40% of our YouTube traffic, so you're talking about video, heavy video traffic on mobile devices. In Japan, in Korea, in Singapore, it's well over 50%. So YouTube it's is more mobile than a PC. YouTube is a mobile product now from my perspective, particularly in this region, but the rest of the world is following. So again, this region is teaching the rest of the world. Many of our clients essentially have more of their traffic on mobile devices already that they have on desktop. However, many of them do not have a mobile strategy, they do not have a mobile website, they might not have a mobile app. They're essentially completely letting down customers. And I'm sure that many people in this room, many people in this room would not be ready for their users on the mobile internet. They are still thinking about a web, desktop web-based internet they're not thinking about servicing the customers differently. They're not thinking about the use cases that are specific to mobile devices. And they'll be eaten up if they don't react very, very quickly. They need to disrupt themselves. And as we heard earlier this morning, if they do not dis uh, disrupt this themselves, if you do not really pay far more attention to what your users are doing on a day-to-day -day basis, someone else will. Actually, that's, you know, as a VC, actually, we like that situation because that gives us a lot of opportunity to invest in smaller companies who are going to focus on that mobile experience and disrupt the incumbents. I think it's a very interesting opportunity. But we'll get back to that uh, speed difference because I think Joe had an interesting theory, so we'll get back to that a little bit later. <laughs> Sounds good. So let me, let me talk very briefly about three trends that we're seeing as part of it, uh, 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 this disruption that we're seeing at global level. Uh, the first one is that everything's connecting. Um, essentially, you know, it's very clear that the most important thing that we need to do is ensure that people are connected around the world. So you think first that, you know, uh, all, um, sorry, everyone is connecting. Uh, all people around the world need really to have access to information, uh, and you see the benefits of it. So um, look at a product like Zucal uh, in Australia. It delivers textbooks. It's very easy for someone with a mobile internet connection to order on their phone and get a textbook delivered to their place. Uh, in Japan, it's probably not as relevant because you have one-day deliveries very easily. Uh, but the reality is that you know, drone deliveries are going to be a factor in most countries around the world. I, is this actually already happening, or is this just a prototype? Yeah, there's some tests uh, happening already in Australia with Zuko. Yeah. There's no legal barriers in Australia? Well, there's, there's plenty of legal barriers. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Um, there's legal barriers everywhere to do things like this, but that's what entrepreneurship is all about. I think we all we heard about uh, uh, Tony's experience earlier. Now, when you are an innovator, you are going to face serious issues with governments, with established companies that are, that are trying to stop what you're trying to do. And uh, the beauty of entrepreneurship is trying to do things differently. So you look at Zucal and you see the benefits that consumers can have. Now, what do you do behind that? Where well, you, you start dreaming of silly things like you know, Project Loon, which we had at Google to essentially try and send balloons 20 kilometers up in the air to try and connect all of the populations of this world that do not have internet access. And you know, we, we tried it a few months ago, and we had a balloon just flying for 22 weeks un uninterrupted, and, and uh, you know, we tested it, and it works well. So we're continuing our test, and you know, these are the types of crazy ideas that enable people to be connected. Uh, the second thing that's going to happen is that everything is going to connect. Uh, so we know there are 10, 10 billion connected devices in the world at the moment. Uh, that figure is going to jump uh, eight times in, within 10 years to 80 billion connected devices. Uh, uh, again, if you count the number of devices with screens that you have in your home, it's not two or three, it'd be probably 25 or 30. These devices have reasons to be connected is they provide benefits to you. So well, Nest, actually, the future of mobile internet is not like people, it's the things. There to be more of them than us. <laughs> well, you, you obviously heard about the internet of things, and, and, and you know, essentially, this, this is happening already. You, know, you see, you know, we've bought Nest recently, a company that provide really cool thermostats uh, and smoke alarms, you know, products that you know, no one really cared about. Well, now, these things essentially provide you with great information in a much easier framework, but more importantly, it saves energy as well. And uh, now some of the uh, um, uh, operators, electricity operators that we work with, essentially trade uh, uh, consumption with users and lower the consumption cost overall um, because of, of tools like this. Now Chromecast also is a very small dongle that essentially 
puts the internet into any dumb TV and, and allows you to start str streaming information that uh, is available in your market. So uh, again, you, you're going to see all the devices changing the way people are accessing information. And importantly, every single industry is changing. You know, you may be thinking that you are in a heavy manufacturing industry, like cars. The reality is that not only your cars will be connected, but you'll have, you know, super smart product like Navia. You know, okay, the car only goes, you know, 12 and a half miles an hour, but those smart products so will... what does this do? It disrupts birds, or what does it do? <laughs> <laughs> it does disrupt birds in this image. But it essentially allows uh, self-driving connections. So this is a self-driving car. Um, you know, when Google announced a self-driving car project a few years ago, everybody thought we were crazy. Uh, the reality is that there are many different manufacturers all around the world working on self-driving cars. It saves lives. It improves traffic. It's pretty critical that you know, many people drive this. And the reality of it is that it's not about manufacturing now. It's that every single company is becoming a software company. No matter which industry you're in, you're becoming a software company. Uh, so in the case of France, what are they actually doing here? So th this is essentially tested at the moment in a Singaporean university, the Singaporean uh, uh, technology uh, um, uh, campus, where you're basically transporting people from one part of the campus to another. You okay. jump in this and provide self-driving transportation within the campus. Now, those of you who uh, may have been to Manju would see our self-driving cars just roaming around all the roads around our campus. Um, and and you know, no it's students really well. have been killed so far? <laughs> oh, that's great. No, nobody's <laughs> been killed. In not, not at 12 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, I get hurt, go a little bit faster, killed. but no. <laughs> and hopefully no birds armed here. <laughs> All right, great. Is this the last, this last, is the last yeah, bit? Okay. Yes. Thank you very much, Karim. So I'm doing the time check. I think the clock here says 8 minutes and 20 seconds. I think that means we have about 8 minutes left. And I would like to actually maybe take one question, at least from the audience. But before that, maybe we'll um, throw some questions at you. And since you know, we prepared a lot of questions, but we <laughs> have uh, less than 10 minutes. So maybe uh, ask uh, you know, any one of you. Um, you know, we've talked about some themes of disruptions. And I think there are obviously some ingredients I think that's necessary for some disrupting things to happen. And, uh, if you were to come up with your own version of a recipe for disruption, what would that what would that might be? Joe, do you want to go with your fluid theory? <laughs> well, we were chatting about it, right? Yeah. Um, just Let's one hear an hour it. ago, and, and I think philosophically, um, there's two ways you could disrupt, right? And then I, I took a fluid dynamics class when I was at MIT, and uh, to me, disruptions are just like turbulence. So basically, I think uh, Air, Air Asia likes that kind of metaphor. So how is disruption? Okay, turbulence? so turbulence <laughs> happens when you have differentiation of speed, right? So when when the air airplane cuts through the air, it generates turbulence at the edge of the wing, right? Especially toward the end of that edge. That's why you see nowadays airplanes now have curved off their wings to reduce the reduce the turbulence there, right? So. To me, that uh, I think most of the ex most of the disruptive innovation examples we shared here, I realized that uh, a lot of them is mobile, mm. and a lot of them is on what I call on the bleeding edge of the technology. We basically use the latest technology to uh, to build some new services that that wasn't be able to build before. But I I want to call attention to what I call the there's another because because you do have the speed differentiation between the, the bleeding edge and the cutting edge. But I personally think that, that there's another even bigger space of innovation happening, which is between the cutting edge, uh, between the cutting edge technology and traditional industries. These are the internet industry move at a faster speed than traditional industry, so there's a speed differential. So if you can have a group of entrepreneurs who are from the traditional industry and somehow they learn the tools of the internet and they start to use that tool to disrupt the same old industry they came from. Then you can also create a lot of value. So, so, so for us, I think that's these two parts are important. And, yeah, and, and I think I just want to interject. And I think Karim actually just gave us one example. I mean, consumers are already moving at the speed of either cutting edge or bleeding edge, um, going on mobile and YouTube. But companies, 
are still, you know, Google, some of your clients, Google clients are still stuck in a PC age. So there's actually speed difference between the movement of consumers and corporations that gives us the opportunity to disrupt. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a very important point there. I think what you see at global level is that the companies that succeed in being uh, disrupting essentially see these trends early and invest early. So, you know, one company that everybody has on their mind now is WhatsApp. You know, it's just been bought for $19 billion by Facebook. WhatsApp decided to build mobile only when the penetration of smartphones in the US was only at 10%. They basically decided their stuff didn't matter anymore. At 10%, they decided to build mobile only. And that's a very strong message. Essentially, if you're looking at a country like Japan, or even a country like India, where smartphone penetration is not that great, but it's already you know, close to 30%, you're thinking, hey, I'm a couple of years late compared to what, WhatsApp. No, exactly. We actually have one example from one of our portfolio here in Japan. Um, they're, they're in a mobile fashion commerce in, uh, industry. And then basically they focus on the mobile side of the product that today, 80% of the sales is from mobile. So 20, only 20% 20 comes from PC. So they can actually shut down their website any day and they can still survive as a business. And I think that reversal is happening very fast. But it, what's important about your example is that actually this company will be far more at the bleeding edge of what users are wanting than any other company. And, and they have far more chances of succeeding in the future. Exactly. One is that if you invest, both a corporate and a VC, if you invest just in the bleeding tech, now the bleeding edge technology, the success rate is always low. It's very cool to be successful, but the success rate is so low. That's the nature of things. Obviously, that's why we are in the venture capital industry. <laughs> uh, so, do you have any comments in terms of you know, recipe for disruption or th things you're seeing in Korea in that space? D just one comment. Um, the word disruption, I, I really don't like that. Um, it, all, all innovation is, is disruptive in a sense. And so, you know, um, there's a lot of innovation that is happening. And uh, my, my, I envy my colleagues in, in Silicon Valley because they, ha they have a, a great investment environment. They have a lot, lot of press attention. But I think you'll see uh, in the coming years uh, in regions like, like China, Korea, Japan, that then more and more innovative services will be emerging from these markets. Thank you. And um, maybe I'll take them one, or, uh, we have about three minutes left, one or two questions from the audience. So uh, in the remaining few minutes, we would like to uh, take uh, maybe one or two uh, questions from the audience, so there will be a microphone for you. So I see a hand in the front, fourth row, please. You guys might need the receivers. Uh, can you uh, state your name and uh, your affiliate? My name is uh, Komai. Uh, at the first, uh, I already use uh, Google, Gmail, and KakaoTalk, I know. Uh, but Thank you. Uh, but, but you know, it's suck. I think that's what oh. he's trying to say. No, uh, oh, no, sure. Then she, Chen Shen Shang, Shen Zai Wu Yong, Wei Xing, who QQ, then she will Hai Mei Yong, Len Len, Shen Zai Bu Nan Yong, Zai Li Bian. I'm sorry, uh, translate English. Uh, now, uh, I already used a Chinese uh, SN service. QQ and a WeChat, but now I didn't use and I couldn't, I cannot use a landline service. Uh, when is uh, you, uh, when will you open your service in Japan? He's asking whether he can use Renin from Japan. So when are we gonna bring uh, Ren to Japan? Uh, I believe there's some Chinese students uh, studying in Japan already using Renren, because everywhere I go, I found Renren uses, particularly in colleges uh, globally, uh, in the US, in, in Japan. I'm pretty sure I, I know some Japanese uh, users, Chinese students uh, coming from uh, Japan here. Uh, we don't have a, a Japanese language translation for services. Um, we're very focused in China. I actually think that for social networks, uh, if you had not started in the U.S., right, I think the core option for global expansion is limited. Right? You started in Japan, 
then most likely you're going to end up doing most of the business in Japan as a social networking service uh, for China as, uh, as well. So if I start another company again, I'm going to start it in Silicon Valley, so I have the core option for global conquest. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll take one more question, Jack. Uh, actually, I mean, if I can say, uh, I don't agree with that comment in the sense okay. that uh, I, uh, I think that there's tremendous appetite and possibilities to start companies in this region. I actually think that because mobile is going to be so critical mm -hmm. and because users are going to know everything about mobile in this region, uh, we're going to see a new wave of innovation um, coming from countries like Japan, Korea. I think India is going to be phenomenal because people are very entrepreneurial there and with access to connectivity, which they don't really have now, uh, is going to lead to a new wave of entrepreneurship. And, and I would say uh, the US, and I work for a US company, is often very blinkered with regards to how they view the world. You need to be in this region to understand what happens. And I would actually strongly suggest to people to spend more time in APAC and even start their companies in this region. But I think the, the only caveat here is that sometimes people get comfortable because Japan's, Japan market is not the biggest, but big enough, so you can just have a comfortable life here without going overseas. So I think some of the great services that are here. I don't think here. entrepreneurs are comfortable <laughs> in themselves. <laughs> but you know, Line is going overseas, but not, there are a lot of innovative services, both in China and Japan, that are not going overseas today. They're kind of comfortable in the domestic market. I think Korea is actually a little bit different because you, your market is not as big as China and Japan. I think more companies in Korea, especially gaming companies, went overseas very early. Right, um, because our market size is small, um, it's it's vital that we we succeed overseas. And uh, but up until now, it, it's very costly to to market your product or service overseas. So um, it's been very hard for for small small startups to to market their products. I think we'll take one more question. Just さっきほど質問あった方お願いいたします. So if you can state your uh, name as well. From Japan. Uh, just a really simple question. So what region in Asia are you really kind of in focus right now? So what, uh, so what country are you most interested in? Um, instead of your, you know, other than your home country, say for example, like Cambodia or Vietnam or whatever, in whatever aspect. Who wants to go first? Um, since we're a small company, we, we obviously we can't do a worldwide uh, marketing, and so we're focusing on Southeast Asia, and namely Indonesia, the Philippines, and Malaysia. Uh, those are the markets that have that market size, the, the population, and uh, uh, the market uh, itself is, is growing rapidly, the, the mobile, um, because of uh, companies like Xiaomi. Uh, uh, Low-end uh, Android phone, phones are being distributed at, at a very fast pace, and so uh, looking into the future, we're investing in, in Southeast Asia. And Joe, apart from China, what are you interested in? So our strategy for globalization is, is um, so we operationally, we focus very much on China because China by itself is a huge marketplace. And the competition is very intense. If you're not focused in China and trying to expand beyond China, then after a few years, you find out that your, even your Chinese business might be taken away by the local competitors. So nobody could afford to uh, lose their focus uh, in China if you are a reasonable large company doing business in China. But, but, but we, we do invest outside of China uh, because we see some trend happening in China. Uh, either we're too busy with our main business, we can't do it in China yet, or the social economical condition not yet ready for that. So we, we try to replicate that in US and Japan, advanced high income countries where the market is big, because you really, you want to do internet, you want to be very successful, all you need to do is really focus on the three biggest market, right? This is the US, Japan, and China. Uh, Chinese economy might be bigger than Japan, but Chinese consumer spending is less than in, J is less than in Japan. So Japan is a, a large, larger internet market. So you focus on these three, you, you'd be very successful. Um, so for us, we invest in Japan and, Ch and, and the US, and we focus operations in China. Okay, Karim, do you have a different point of view? Oh, well, uh, I look after APAC uh, only, so my focus is uh, solely on APAC. Uh, we have offices in most of the country in the region, and it's very important for us to continue to develop our presence. We have products mostly everywhere. Um, 
Obviously, our presence in China is limited with regards to the extent of the products we can have there. However, I keep a very strong eye on what's happening in China because I think there's a, there's a lot of very important trends and, and some very uh, smart, innovative play, players coming out of China. I'm based uh, here in Japan, so I do spend a lot of time in the market. We also see a lot of potential for innovation, and, and there's a renewed sense of optimism here, which is very important, as well as in Korea, where there's a lot of strong technologies. And then from a user change perspective, I really look at India and Indonesia. Um, the, the type of access or the type of things that users are doing on the internet in these countries and how they access the internet is actually starting to be slightly different. So I, I keep a strong eye on this too. Which country did you mention? India and Indonesia. Indone India and Indonesia. I think uh, we are already five minutes over time, so I'd like to wrap up the session here. So thank you very much, our great panelists. And thank you very much. And please give the panelists a big round of applause. Thank you very much.